Hello, bonjour, and welcome to your new Bonheur Private Wines video. Today I want to explain the concept you would have heard me mentioning quite a few times in these videos, the concept that is called in French originally because of course it's about wine. So the French first defined it and invented the term terroir or terroir as you would say it in English. The word itself comes from the French word for earth, terre. Every sommelier and winemaker and every wine connoisseur talks about it as soon as you dig a little bit into the origin of a wine and how it was crafted, etc. Essentially, as soon as you have an interest into where your wine comes from, well, and you start digging and doing some research and ask anybody involved about how the wine was crafted, you'll be answered in some fashion or another through the concept of terroir. So what is it? Let's explain. In short, it's as simple as this. What we call the terroir is the climate plus the soil, because those are the two most obvious parameters that impact the taste of your vino. A grapevine, as you know, is a plant, so it lives between earth and skies. It lives and feeds from the soil underneath it. It absorbs nutrients from, and then, as you know, it gets a bit of water from rain, usually, unless it's irrigated, but I'll pass on this for now, and I'll have a word on irrigation in a little while and it gets energy from sunlight. Photosynthesis, I know you know about this, but how does this matter to the taste of wine? Famously, grapes are one of the fruits that is the most impacted by the soil composition. I explained in a previous video that grapes don't really have a strong aromatic signature as a fruit. It doesn't have these few aromas that makes you instantly identify what it is like say a lemon, an orange, a pear, a pineapple, those have really strong aromas of lemon, orange, pear or pineapple. So as soon as you smell them or taste them, you instantly recognize them as such. Grapes are more of a chameleon uh, aromatically. They can change their taste and aromatic profile into a variety of different fruit expressions, not just one. That's why we talk about strawberry flavors, cherry, the lemon, orange blossom, tropical fruits, depending on every wine and so on. We associate different fruit flavors to different wines. And of course, the climate plays a huge part here, particularly through the level of ripeness of the grapes, how much acidity the wine and the grapes will eventually retain at maturity, how much sugar it has, but also what they'll taste like eventually, grassier, zingier, more citrusy and more herbal in cooler climates or more opulent in jammy raisin-like under hot climates. So that's the terroir summarized for you here, where on earth, the grapes are grown. Is there layers of limestone underneath the vineyard? Is there clay? Is there different types of rocks and sand? Is there a sea or an ocean nearby? A lake next to it? Is it on a slope? Is it in a plain? Is it facing south, north, east, west? All of this matters to the taste of wine. But terroir is not only that. When I studied winemaking in Bordeaux, France some 20 years ago, learning from professors that had been making Bordeaux wines for the most part of the second half of the 20th century, they taught us students also that a huge component of terroir beyond climate and soil is the human factor that impacts the grape production and the winemaking. So let's take. This aspect of terroir is particularly important in the old world that has been making wine for centuries, if not millennia. The human aspect of terroir is, is what we call the traditions, and traditions do evolve for sure. So sure, Burgundy has a different climate than Bordeaux or the Rhone Valley or Chianti in Italy, has a different climate in soil than Valpolicella, for example, but they also have different grape varieties, so different types of grapes that were specifically selected by growers over the centuries to taste like they do, or at least to suit the local growing conditions. And that's very important. Then growers plant vines at different densities in their vineyards, depending on the region. More plants per acre 
or less. They use different vine growing techniques, of course, different viticulture techniques, techniques. They use different oak treatments on the wines as well. Some use larger or smaller barrels, some use large oak vats, some have used concrete tanks or now stainless steel tanks rather than oak for a long time as well. So traditionally, every region in Europe in particular had pretty much its own way of growing grapes and making wines and those were quite consistent from one producer to the other within the region because that's what they knew and because of local traditions, local customs and that impacted the quality of the wines dramatically. Famously, as an example, Chablis wines, white Chardonnay wines from a specific village of Burgundy have always been less oaky than Chardonnays from Merceau, a different village in Burgundy. Or Spanish Rioja wines have always had a huge addition of flavors from long aging in American oak barrels, which they have loved using for a long time because the Spanish have had access to American oak for a long time. Italians have always been less inclined to using small French style oak barrels because they didn't have access to French oak barrels. There's no oak tree growing that is suitable for making wine really well. In Italy, they couldn't really get French oak barrels, so they've used large oak vats that they made from oak imported from the neighboring country that is not France, that is Slovenia. So Italian wines have always been less oaky than most French wines, and that's a huge difference in how the wines taste based on local traditions alone. Those traditions have often also made it into local regulations in Europe to bear the name of an appellation on a label like a Chianti or a Bordeaux, you often must obey certain regulations and practices defined by all traditions to make sure the wines taste quite consistent in this appellation with this name on the label. So never forget that terroir is not only the natural environment of a wine. It's also its context of production influenced by the people, humans, who make it. And this is particularly true of course in the old world but it's made its way to the new world as well to a certain extent. A Napa wine tastes generally like a Napa wine because it's quite hot and there's a certain type of soil there but also because that's what's expected from a Napa wine. So that's how Napa wineries make their wine, taste like a Napa wine. So it exists in the new world as well. To really understand this and how it impacts your life as a wine consumer, now we need to get a little bit into the modern history of wine and winemaking. Before the end of the 1990s and the early 2000s, most wines were really driven by the terroir because most modern winemaking techniques had not really allowed to dramatically change the taste of a wine to the point that its origin couldn't be recognized anymore but that really shifted really strongly around the year 2000 and many attributes it to the influence of wine critics in particular, especially US wine critics, especially, you might expect this, Robert Parker. Suddenly what mattered most for selling a wine was its score, its rating given by top wine publications such as Robert Parker's Wine Advocate or the Wine Spectator magazine, for example, to name a couple of very significant ones. And to get, the, to get those high pointers of a wine, as a producer, you needed to advance the maturity of your grapes so as to have a richer body, softer tannins, more cooked, jammy, sweeter flavors. You needed to get your wine through a lot of new oak to get strong, oaky flavors of vanilla, coconut, caramel, and so on. So everybody around the world started doing that virtually in Spain, in Bordeaux, in Tuscany, in Australia. They also planted the same grapes everywhere, Cabernet and Chardonnay leading, of course, all around the world. Standardization, it was called at some point of wine. Now those rich, oaky, opulent wines are what we call non-terroir driven wines because they taste more of the way the grapes were grown and the wine was made than of where they truly genuinely come from. In fact, in many cases, it's a lot harder to identify these wines 
origin, uh, when you taste them blind, they're so oaky, they're so jammy, they, they all taste a bit like raisin and like plums and prunes, that it's hard to tell the difference between a wine from Australia, California or South Africa. This around 2000 period is also when new world wines really bloomed uh, relative to the traditional European wines. So a lot of this success was made possible by irrigation. By irrigating vines, suddenly you could grow loads of grapes in very warm and dry climates like Argentina, Australia, Chile, California and so on. So those climates, in fact, as long as you have water, are better to grow rich and jammy grapes than the cooler climates of Europe where they just use rainwater. The benefit of this though is that it made wine overall as a drink more approachable, more suited to pleasing the broader crowd of consumer tastes, so more people got into drinking wine, so the whole wine industry grew which allowed new world wines to bloom without annihilating the old world. For the past 10 years though, the wine industry pretty much as a whole has steadily been going to making more terroir driven wines, less cooked by the sun, which in addition allows to reduce the alcohol levels, something that many wine consumers look out for. Wines that are less oaky and therefore wines that taste more like the soils they were grown on. Every wine producer now tries to find its own distinctive signature, its own identity through its wines. Consumers and producers alike have realized that letting the grapes speak for themselves about their soil, about their climate, about their topography is the best way to make each and every wine truly unique. Because every piece of earth on the planet is by nature different. So you don't need to invent a variety of wine, you don't need to think through a wine's identity, it's already there, defined by nature itself. So many wine producers prefer now investing in developing more costly, environmentally friendly wine growing techniques or developing them rather than buying expensive French oak wine barrels for their wines. It respects their environment better where they live and it makes their wine more distinctive and unique as well. So everyone wins. Terroir is wine and wine is terroir and as wine consumers get more educated about it they understand this and they appreciate it better. As I'm sure you do also as an enlightened member of the Bonner Wine Club because of course bringing you those wines that we love that have a true story and a true origin is a big part of what we do and we love to bring you those stories as well. And now you know a little bit more about why terroir matters. On this final note, I'll leave it here for today. Thanks for watching and I will see you soon in the wonderful world of delicious vino. Cheers.